This is Living Power with Dan Hurst. Okay, let's take a look at some of the uh, uh, news events that have been going on. There's a news thing that happened. Actually, this is back. This was reported back on the first of July, but since it wasn't here, I, I missed it. But I wanted you to see this: that Hamas uh, is now bragging about a three and a half longer tunnel to reach Israel, and they said on that Sunday that it, uh, this new terror tunnel. Will reach into Israel. Now remember the last war that uh, when Israel attacked uh, Gaza was to destroy those tunnels and it, it was just a, a huge, huge undertaking on their part. And uh, now they're back at it again. According to a group of members who spoke to the Al Alam Arabic language TV station, the tunnel is just over two miles long. It will be used in the next round of violence against Israel. We're already bragging about that. Meanwhile, sounds of digging have been reported in border communities in Israel. And due to the mounting concerns over the tunnels, the IDF has invested in developing tunnel detection technology centers were deployed. Hamas military preparations are ongoing, including the deployment of troops along Israel's border and infantry and urban warfare exercises conducted at all, all levels. So Hamas has made it very clear they're going back to the war. They, they're not pulling any punches about it. They intend to do this. Now what's happened is ISIS has moved in to Gaza. And so uh, the ISIS element is, is uh, becoming a, uh, a significant issue in Gaza. But I think I read uh, a couple of weeks ago that 14% of, uh, uh, of the jihadists in, in Gaza now are ISIS. Yeah. And that's growing all the time. Um, then another news story, July the 7th, U.S. and Russia are facing off in the Middle East. For those who believe uh, that what governments do is related to what they say. Moscow and Washington's statements about one another are increasingly troubling. While actually rather cautious in its language, the United States national military strategy is the latest example of evolving official threat assessments that describe new risks of direct conflict between the two countries. As a strategic region and one of the enduring competition and instability, the Middle East may well experience some of the consequences. Signed by the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, the strategy states, and get this, the probability of U.S. involvement in interstate war with a major power is assessed to be low but growing. And so here we are, we've already stationed, we've, uh, we've got tanks and, and armament and everything in a number of those countries uh, that are bordering with Russia and uh, in order to protect our NATO partners. But uh, that element is growing, and I guess you saw in the news that there were two Russian bombers that were intercepted on July 4th, flying towards the United States, uh, and so that was just a, that was just in, that was just needling us. That's all that was on July 4th. We sent in a couple of Russian bombers. Uh, they didn't reach our airspace, but because they were intercepted, but that was obviously intentional. And so there's just that's starting to happen more and more and more. And Russia is starting to flex its muscle over that. Um, look at this. Bible codes hint to arrival of Messiah after the current Shemitah year. Remember we talked about the Shemitah, the, the seven-year uh, cycle, the seven-year cycle that, and, uh, uh, that uh, it's not really practiced that much, but it's very important to the Jews. But look at this. Uh, this was in Breaking Israel News. There are two verses in chapter 12 of the book of Daniel that use the same unusual phrase, until the time of the end. In a recent video, Rabbi... Matiyahu Glazerson, prolific author and one of the world's leading experts on Bible codes, uses gematria, which is the system of assigning numerical values to the Hebrew words, and Bible codes to connect this phrase to the imminent coming of Messiah, son of David. This is Jewish news. This is not, this is what the, this is what the Jews themselves are saying, some of them. The two verses are, and you, Daniel, close up the words and seal the book until the time of the end. Many will run to and fro, and the knowledge will increase. That's in Daniel 12, 4. Then in Daniel 12, 9, and he said, Go, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed until the end, until the time of the end. In essence, Galatians is suggesting that until the time of the end is the same as the upcoming Hebrew year, which begins at nightfall on Sunday, September 13, which is also associated with Messiah, so David. Isn't it interesting that, uh, that now the Jews are saying, you know, Israeli students, not Christians, Israeli students are now saying that uh, they're expecting through Bible code the Messiah to appear. 
uh, U.S. fears that Iran will release billions for terror attacks. This is something that's ongoing uh, that I that amazes me. You know, in the, in the discussion that the uh, U.S. And, and Iran are going through right now. A nuclear agreement with Iran could give Tehran $100 billion in financial windfall, a sum that even the Obama administration is concerned could be used to finance terrorism against American interests. We are, of course, aware and concerned that despite the massive domestic spending needs facing Iran, some of the resulting sanctions relief could be used by Iran to fund destabilizing actions, the State Department official uh, said. The U.S. sees Iran clearly for what it is, the world's foremost state sponsor of terrorism, a supporter of terrorist groups such as Hezbollah and Hamas, a backer of the Assad regime's brutality in Syria, and a force for instability in Yemen. Now, I give you that news story, and I want you to see this uh, relative news story to this. This, uh, this was out yesterday. U.S. Iran nuclear talks extended through Monday. Russian President Vladimir Putin said Friday that all sanctions from Iran need to be lifted, and he said he hopes the talks reach a resolution soon. We know what's going on there. We're in touch with our partners in Vienna. I hope the document will be signed soon. Uh, Putin added, we're coming from the fact that all sanctions need to be lifted from Iran. Sanctions are not the way to solve problems. In my view, compromise will be found soon. So now there's this push, and last time that we were looking at news, which was two weeks ago, uh, we saw a quote by Kerry, Senator Kerry, saying that we're willing to lift sanctions and you know not make that relative to the nuclear disarmament and so forth and so on. It's like we're backing down, conceding all of these things, and uh, just just giving in is really what it amounts to. And now Russia is saying, you know, you need to do that also, pressuring of the U.S. government to give in. Of course, Russia has some uh, sanctions on it also, so that would give reason why uh, Putin would say that sanctions don't work. So there's this this political play, a uh, word play that's going on. What we'll accept, what we won't accept, what we'll, we'll accept, what we won't accept. I don't know how it's all going to end, but I find it interesting that they keep extending it and keep extending it, which is really Iran's ploy that has been for all along. So that's where we are. We're in a, in a point in a time of real indecision in the world. In the meantime, uh, everything else just seems to continue and continue and continue to build. Let's have a word of prayer and we'll get into our study today and take a look at a few more things. Father, I pray that you would give us insight to understand your word, how you see this time, how you see us in this time, what we're supposed to do, how we fit in, what our calling is, our ministry, our role, our responsibilities. So, Father, I pray that you would speak to us now, this morning, and uh, give us a handle on this, and how we're to live our lives, and cause us to see ourselves the way you see us. I pray this in the holy name of Jesus. We established over the past few weeks that it appears that we're coming to the close of what we call the church age. That's the period of time that the church will have existed on earth. Essentially, uh, it is the time that Holy Spirit became active and is active through God's people. That period of time which the Holy Spirit came upon the disciples, which is talked about in Acts, and that, that's when the church was established. And that church age continues until the day that the church is raptured and taken out of the world. So that is considered the church age. And while we don't know the exact day or hour, as the Bible teaches, we are given some signs and some clear evidence regarding when the end of that time will happen. So I want you to take a look at some scripture that talks about when that's going to happen. What are the signs? What, what do we know? What, what, what can we expect? In Matthew 24, starting with verse 3, Jesus is sitting on the Mount of Olives. The disciples come to him privately and say, Tell us when will these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? And Jesus answered them, See that no one leads you astray. For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ. And they will lead many astray. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you're not alarmed, for this must take place. But the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these are but the beginning of birth pains. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and put you to death, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many will fall away and betray one another and hate one another. And many false prophets will arise and lead many astray. And because lawlessness will be increased, the love of many will grow cold. 
but the one who endures to the end will be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And then the end will come. So what's happening is, what Jesus is saying is, after, after those, those wars and the rumors of wars and earthquakes, which has been going on for some time, at some point it kicks into another gear. And we begin seeing how pe even people from within the church, they begin to betray one another, and hate one another, and false prophets arise, and lawlessness is increased, and, and, and the love of many grows cold. Uh, and, and there's this massive increase of chaos that just begins to build and it is included within the church. And there is all of this. The one thing that I really want to key in on this is that they will deliver you up to tribulation and put you to death. And you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. The Christian missionary organization called Open Doors, which is out of, uh, out of the UK, estimates that 100 million Christians face persecution particularly Muslim-dominated countries, in, in Muslim-dominated countries. 100 million Christians now are undergoing persecution. According to the International Society for Human Rights, up to 80% of acts of persecution are directed at people of the Christian faith. Of all of the acts of persecution going on in the world, 80% are targeted at Christians. According to the World Evangelical Alliance, over 200 million Christians are denied fundamental human rights solely because of their faith. So it's all about who you trust and who you believe and who you follow. And if you are going to be a Christian, chances are you're going to be dealing with that. There, and it's even growing in our own country now. There is just a, a backlash against Christians. And we're going to see the church persecuted like never before in our own country. Uh, Joel put it this way, and we looked at this a couple of weeks ago. Joel said, And I will show wonders in the heavens and on the earth, blood and fire and columns of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. And what Joel was talking about there was the end of the church age. The beginning of the church age, as Peter talked about, he was also quoting Joel, he was talking about your young men will see you know, have dreams and visions, and you know there will be there will be uh, teachings, and all of this all of this will happen. Well, that's what happened at the beginning of Acts when the church was started, and that's what Peter was saying. This is the fulfillment of that prophecy, but this part of that prophecy is yet to be fulfilled, and that's what brings about the end of the church age. And so, as we saw a few weeks ago, what all the earth, the, the, the blood, and the fire, and the color, the smoke, and how all of that really intensifying in the world today. But then in Luke, listen to what Jesus said in Luke, Luke 21. But when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then know that desolation has come near. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains, and let those who are inside the city depart, and let not those who are out of the country enter it. For these days of vengeance, these are days of vengeance to fulfill all that is written. Last for women who are pregnant and those who are nursing infants in those days, for there will be great distress upon the earth and wrath against this people, this people being God's people. They will fall by the edge of the sword and be led captive among all nations, and Jerusalem will be trampled underfoot by the Gentiles, meaning non-Jews, until the time when the Gentiles are fulfilled. Until that time is up. So God says, okay, time's up. And there will be signs in sun and moon and stars and on the earth distress of nations in perplexity because of the roaring of the sea and the waves uh, people fainting with fear and the foreboding of what is coming on the world do you notice that everybody thinks something is about to happen whether they're Christians or not foreboding of what is coming on the world for the powers of the heavens will be shaken and then they will see the son of man coming in a cloud with power and great glory and when these things begin to take place, when these things begin to take place, straighten up and raise your heads because your redemption is drawing near. So the messages in the second and third chapters of Revelation are critical to us today. These are messages to the church in the end times. That's us. And just as the law was given to God's people through Moses in that day for that people, and the prophecies were given in that time period for that people. 
and, and certainly they deal with us. And the good news, the gospel was given through Jesus during that time that he walked on earth. And the teachings were given by the apostles to the early church in that time for those people and also for us. And really all of those previous truths and messages are significant to us today. But now these messages to the church in the second and third chapters of Revelation are critical to us because they are to the church that will bring a close to the church age. That's us. So let's get into these these messages, these seven messages that are given to the church. And today we're going to take a look at the first one, which was written to the church at Ephesus. Now, the fact that it was written to Ephesus isn't particularly critical to Ephesus. It's critical to us because the message applies to us. There's seven messages, and that's just how, uh, how John delivered the message to the seven different churches. But there are seven messages that we need to know about that we need to understand how God sees the church today and what we need to be doing. So here's the first message, Revelation chapter 2, starting with verse 1. To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, The words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your works, your toil, and your patient endurance, and how you cannot bear with those who are evil. But have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and found them to be false. I know you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake, and you have not grown weary. But I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love you had at first. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen. Repent and do the works you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Yet this you have, you hate the works of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Now, I've got good news and bad news. Have you ever heard that? Say, of course you have. Usually it's a joke of some sort. But sometimes it's not so funny. Like when the boss says, I've got good news and bad news, and it usually means more work, or cutbacks, or both. Or when the doctor says, I've got good news and bad news, that usually means that something pretty serious is happening, but that there is some hope. But when God says, I've got good news and bad news, it means that we better listen and act accordingly. That's why you'll notice that the message to each of these seven churches, every message concludes with these words, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. That's you. If you have an ear to hear, you listen to these seven messages. Listen to these messages to the churches. In other words, we're to hear and act on all seven of these messages. And in this first message, God says, I've got good news and bad news. Here's the good news. I know your works, your toil, your patient endurance. How you don't bear with those who are evil. You've tested those who call themselves apostles and aren't. I know you're enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake. You've not grown weary. And what God was saying and is saying to us is, look, I see the good. I see the good in your life. I, I note the good intentions in your life. I see that. And he commends a good work ethic, which I think is really important for us to understand. That in this day and time, we have to maintain a strong, healthy work ethic with great integrity. We have to be the model laborers. We have to be the model workers in this day and time. We have to be the model neighbors. We have to be the model community servants. We have to be the model citizens. That's our job. We have to be what, what the world needs. And God commends that kind of work ethic. And he encourages sound and wise teaching. He says, look, don't put up with false teaching. Make sure that the teaching that you're getting is valid. The Nicolaitans were, well, they were snakes. We'll talk about that in a little bit. But they, they were, there, were some, there was some false teaching that was going on in the early church. And it continues today. And I am amazed at looking at, at you know, the thing that amazes me is, you know, when we get to heaven, there aren't going to be any Baptists or Methodists or Presbyterians or Catholics in heaven. I know that just stung some of you and bother some of you, but we're not going to be, we're going to be God's people. 
That's who we are. And and we're gonna have to, I know, I know how this comes across, but we're actually gonna have to sit at the marriage supper of the Lamb with some Methodists. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and and you know what? God's not gonna care. I really don't think God cares that we are all split up in the different denominations. I mean, I, I think he bothers him that we are, but I don't think he, he looks at us and says, oh, they're good, they're good people, they're Baptists, they're good, they're whatever, they're not so good, and, you know. And then, you know, because, good Lord, they're what? I think 47 different kinds of Baptists? And they're all whack. <laughs> um, and, and so, you know, when we get to heaven, we're all going to be God's people, that's it. It's, and, and we're going to be the church. The church isn't going to be defined by a name or denomination or church polity or whether they baptize infants or not or, or whether they, you know, all of these rules and regulations that we have. I don't know what we're going to do about business meetings. <laughs> we don't have anything to do. Uh, but that's important for us to understand that what God says, look, you, you listen to to teaching that is proper, that is right. And I see so many churches beginning to fall, unfold, is a good way to put it, fall apart because of false teachings. You know, and they take things out of context and they, they hold certain truths. And I was amazed that, I can't remember what church it is, I don't even really, it doesn't matter to me, but there's some church that's making a big deal about they're going to boycott Israel. This is a church that claims to be a Christian church. And they're going to boycott Israel uh, for whatever reason they got. And I'm thinking to myself, first of all, your church, is, your denomination is one of the smallest denominations, and it's dying on the vine. And you're making a really stupid statement because it, it sounds like it's a big deal, and it isn't, because you don't have any teeth. And so to make a big deal out of it, I think you're just making Christianity look stupid. You know, we're, we're taking a stand. Oh, Oh, uh, grow up. Um, you know, you, that's, that's, we need to understand. We're not called to take stands, you know, political stands and so forth and so on. We're here to follow and obey our Lord and Master, Jesus Christ. That's what we're called to do. And when there's a battle and with all the stuff, nonsense that's going on in politics and everything, our calling is to be faithful to the Lord God. That's what we're supposed to do. We are a remnant of God's people focused on obeying the Word of God. And that's what we'll do. That's where we will stand on the Word of God. And if we are preaching before it, so be it. God said it's going to happen. It's going to happen. But our calling is to stand true and faithful to the Word of God. And that's what we need to be doing now in our churches today is making sure that the teachings are true, they're valid, they're real. And then not putting up with false teaching. Um, by the way, I say that, and I and I am so incredibly grateful that God has given us a pastor who teaches the word. You know? I mean, he, he is focused. On it. But I will also tell you that he's under fire. Any man who going to stand up and preach the word of God is coming under fire, and we need to be surrounding him in prayer. Not only him, but his family and and, uh, and the rest of the staff. Most of the staff, some of them, <laughs> some of them we should be praying about instead of praying. About. I'm kidding. I'm, but you know, it's, we need to be focused on who we are and what we're called to do, and stand on that, and encourage one another, and and, and just embrace each other with God's love. And, uh, and continue the, the walk, the faith. And then, which leads us to the next thing that Jesus says, that God says, is that he blesses patience and endurance. See, when we do that, it's going to require patience and endurance. And God is aware of that. And he will give us that strength. He will give us that courage. That's the good news. Now the bad news. But I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love you had at first. Abandoning your spiritual passion, that's called backsliding. Abandoning your spiritual passion. Backsliders aren't necessarily wicked, evil people. Generally, they're good people who maintain a 
certain level of commitment and, and moral standard, but they've slipped or they've compromised in one or more significant spiritual areas, or they're just coasting spiritually, not really growing. That's abandoning your spiritual passion. Now, I want you to compare that to the mature spiritual passion that Paul talks about, that he, he prayed this for the church, and the church just happened to be the church of Ephesus. So this is a letter written, direct, this letter in particular, this, one, this message directed to the church at Ephesus, it's directed to us, but it was directed to the church at Ephesus. Look what Paul prayed for the church of Ephesus many years before that time. It's in Ephesians chapter 3. For this reason I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with a power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length, height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Now does that sound like the church that has abandoned the love you had at first? Something happened. Something happened in this church. They were passionate. There was, there, was a, there was a focus. They had a calling. They had a ministry. They had something to accomplish. And somewhere along the line, they lost it. They lost. They abandoned that first love. Now, what is the love that God is talking about here? Remember the definition of, and the word that's used is agape. So remember the definition of agape love? It's allowing God to do something in someone else's life through you. Allowing God to do something in someone else's life through you. And that's what God is looking for in your life. What they had abandoned, what they were talking about, you have abandoned the love you had at first was, you have abandoned that passion to let God do something in someone else's life through you. Let me ask you something. Has that happened in your life? Has that happened in your life where all of a sudden, you know, you, you had that spiritual passion earlier in your, in your Christian walk? Somewhere along the line, it just kind of got a little cold. Life happens, and you're not quite there. You've lost some of that spiritual passion. What do you do about it? Well, this is what God says in this message to, to, the, to the church at Ephesus and to us. Remember, therefore, from where you were fall. Remember, remember what you were. Repent. And do the works you did at first. If not, I'll come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. In other words, you lose that, that opportunity, that calling. The lampstand works in the church. You lose the church. You lose that. If, you, if that passion goes away, you're not a church anymore. You're not what the church is all about. So what is he saying? Well, he's saying, remember where you were spiritually. Secondly, repent. That means to get back into God's will. Get back into God's will. Don't just stand on the edge looking in, but get back in. We call it the island. Get back on the island of God's will. And then restore your spiritual passion. Well, how does that happen? How do you restore your spiritual passion? I love what Jesus explained. He was asked, actually, he was being challenged. You know, what's the greatest law? And Jesus said this in Mark 12, 30, which is exactly what, what, what spiritual passion is. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. That spiritual passion. Can you say that? Can you do that? Can you say that you honestly feel that way, that you just love the Lord God with your heart and your soul and your mind and your strength. How do you do that? You do that by submitting to his word, for one. Submitting to his word, getting into the word, discovering him. I mean, the word is the revelation of Jesus Christ. That's what the word is. The Bible is Jesus Christ in written form. 
So you get to know God. Get back into his word and get to know him. Spend time with him. And as you spend time with him and as he begins to work in your life and begins to, to give you the, the motivation and the direction that he wants, follow, obey. You see, when your focus is on God, when your focus is on him, then he begins to respond to that. Psalm 37, 4, you've heard me quote this a thousand times. Delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. In other words, he will put his desires in your life. That's how God will motivate you. When He is the delight of your life. When he, is, when he is everything that Jesus was talking about in that statement. When He becomes all of that to you. Then God begins to motivate you by putting His desires in your heart. And you begin to renew that passion. There is that desire to be everything that God has called you to be. I will tell you something you're a Christian, you want to be what God wants you to be. You have that innate desire to be what God's called you to be. That's there. But something has just disconnected in so many people's lives. There's just been a, a, a sense of loss or a sense of failure, and it's just gone. Something's happened. But when God begins to speak, and when you begin to know that He really is at work in your life, and you begin to look around and see everything that's going on, and you can still say, God's in control. And know it and believe it. Then there begins to become this reconnect with God. And God becomes preeminent in your life. And you recognize that you're here now, at this point, at this place in history, because God has put you here for his purpose and his plan. And so the result of that is that you decide that you're going to hold fast to God's truth. I'm not going to start looking at other things and deciding, well, maybe I'll do some of this and some of that. No. Build your life on God's truths. Build your life on God's truths. Now, what happened here was that there were some Nicolaitans. These were people who claimed to be Christians but lived a life that was really quite offensive to God. And I'm not sure because Paul doesn't say this, but these may have been the very people in the church earlier in the church that were just kind of there and they hadn't really taken over and hadn't really developed a, a, a big problem in the church yet. But they were there. And Paul may have been talking about these very people in his letter to the Ephesians. For example, in Ephesians chapter 4, he said this, Now this I say and testify in the Lord that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. They are darkened in their understanding alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to their hardness of heart. They have become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity, but that is not the way you learn Christ. That may have been what Paul was warning them about, these Nicolaitans. People who were just kind of in it for what's in it for me. What can I get out of this? What will make me feel good? And there are churches, huge churches, built on that very premise. What's in it for me? How can I feel good about myself? And there are TV preachers that will get up that, and basically say, preach a sermon that is about making you feel good about yourself. Look, it's not about you. I want you to feel good about yourself. You should. I mean, God created you in His image. You ought to be feeling really good about that. But... That's not the point. God put you here now, at this point in history, at this time, because he has a purpose and a plan for your life. That's what you need to be focused on. Not, oh, I feel good because I'm, I, I love myself. <laughs> good? Because nobody else does. Because <laughs> you're a moron. <laughs> You've lost the focus of what your life is all about. When you start living your life about, oh, how can I feel good about myself? You've lost the focus of what God wants to do in and through your life. So, and in fact, uh, Paul went on to say, and this must have been a, a significant problem that Paul saw developing in this church. And in, in Ephesians chapter 5, it says, therefore, be imitators of God. Isn't that an awesome way to put it? Be an imitator of God. As beloved 
children. Have you ever noticed a child who is who's just nuts about his, his parents? He imitates them. She imitates them. We have a little grandson, Jackson, who just turned one back in May. And he's right at that stage now where he starts mimicking. And boy, he just loves to do what the people that he loves to be around, he loves to do what they do. Guess who leads him down the wrong path? <laughs> <laughs> Not Marsha. We learned to do raspberries yesterday. I was so proud. It was awesome. But that's what it, but when we're God's children, that's what it says. Be an imitator of God. You love him. You want to do the things that you see him doing. You want to be part of him and, and because you are part of him. And walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. But sexual immorality and all impurity or covetousness must not even be named among you as is proper among saints. Boy, have we failed in that area. Let there be no filthiness, nor foolish talk, nor crude joking, which are out of place, but instead let there be thanksgiving. For you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure or who is covetous, that is an idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. That means you're not going to enjoy the kingdom of God on earth. There's no blessing in your life. It doesn't mean you're going to hell. It means that you're not going to enjoy what life is all about, what God created you for, what he wants out of your life, what he wants to do in and through your life. You're not going to enjoy that. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not become partners with them. For at one time you were darkness, but now you are the light of the Lord. Or the light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. I love that passage. It starts with the imitators of God and ends with This is also the same passage that goes on and says, and don't be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. I love the conclusion of this first message to us. It's in Revelation 2, verse 7. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Isn't that interesting? It's a beautiful promise that's given to you. A beautiful promise that if you will renew your passion, if you will let that begin to grow in your life again, where you are, as Jesus said, loving the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. If that begins to happen in your life, there's this gorgeous promise from God that says that if you will heed that and overcome those obstacles that keep you from accomplishing it, that you will enjoy what God wanted from the very beginning. Do you remember the very beginning? Genesis 2, verse 9, And out of the ground the Lord made to spring up every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. God said, I want you to enjoy this. I, this is for you. The tree of life was created for Adam and Eve. It was created for you and me. And there's this promise that if we will do this, if our passion is renewed, our spiritual passion is renewed, there is a promise from God that we will enjoy the tree of life in the new paradise. Revelation 22, which we'll see in a few years, <laughs> um, says this, Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb, through the middle of the street of the city, also on either side of the river, the tree of life with its twelve kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. promise that is given to us. We will enjoy the tree of life with its 12 fruit, which Marcia includes bananas. <laughs> Marcia hates bananas, but someday she's 
going to have to eat them. <laughs> no, that's not the kind of fruit it's talking about. Do you want to know what kind of fruit it's talking about? Well, you'll just have to be here on that Sunday that we're in Revelation 22. I'm not sure what that'll be. <laughs> we'll be talking about it. But what a magnificent promise. Don't, don't you see that? Isn't that glorious that God says, look, if you just renew your passion, your spiritual passion, discover, to let me be the Lord of your life, delight yourself in me, let me begin motivating you. Let me begin to put my desires in your heart that, you will accomplish, that you'll accomplish what it is that I want to accomplish in and through your life today, at this point in history, at this time, because of what's going on, I need you now. And if you'll do that, It's in paradise. And it comes right out from the throne of God. And God says, wait till you see it. On behalf of Dan Hurst and the Open Class, we want to thank you for watching. We hope it was a blessing.